Spreadsheet Models, Chapter 10, Sections 10.1 through 10.3. So spreadsheet models are things like Excel that we're all used to looking at. Um, and they're great. They tend to be mathematical logic based models. Uh, they are typically are easy to use, quite quick to come up with results to. It's easy to actually modify them. They're not expensive and often they come loaded on uh, hardware that we buy. When we buy a computer, they're often loaded on there. So when we we're going to build a spreadsheet model, what's some good things to actually do to make sure our model looks pretty good and it actually works well? So um, what we're going to do is look at an actual example of a company called Nolin Plastics. And this company actually produces uh, cell phone covers. Uh, the best selling one is called the Viper model. And um, the annual cost or the annual fixed cost for the Viper cover, this, this thing they're making, the cell phone cover, is $234,000. So the fixed cost, let's go here, fixed, fixed cost, equals $234,000. That's kind of a big fixed cost. So if I'm going to produce one unit, I've got $234,000 to set up. And so it's quite a lot of money. Uh, the fixed cost includes management time, advertising, and other costs that are incurred regardless of the number of units eventually produced. Now, in addition to that, uh, the total variable cost including labor and materials is two dollars per unit so when i produce one of them the variable cost for each unit is going to be two dollars per unit now this company wants to consider outsourcing the manufacture of these uh, cell phone cases so uh, it's actually gone to an outside company and they said to them look we'll produce these cell phone cases for you for three dollars and 50 cents so you may say well that's kind of crazy three dollars and fifty cents I mean they can make them for two dollars themselves but yeah they've also got the fixed cost if they make them themselves if they actually just outsource it they don't have the fixed cost they may pay more per unit they are paying more per unit um, a lot more per unit but they avoid the uh, fixed cost so the question is really um, they have to make a decision should we make them or should we buy them in? Or should we buy them from somebody else? Should we outsource them? So the, the question then is, well, how are we going to make that decision? It's kind of based on the quantity they want to order. Because if they're going to order, say, one case, then obviously if they order one case, the cost for one case, the cost to make one case is going to be themselves. It's going to be $234,000 plus two dollars for that one case. That's 234,000, that's a lot of money. That's if they make it themselves. The cost, if they outsource of one case, is $3.50. So you can see, when they're making a, a relatively small number of cases, it's best to outsource because they avoid this big cost in here. However, if they were gonna make, say for example, um, a million cases, then it's going to be best to actually make them themselves because if they make a million cases, the cost to make a million uh, uh, cases themselves compared to the cost to make uh, to outsource a million cases is going to be less. So when you outsource a million cases, it's going to cost you $3.5 million to actually outsource a million cases. But if you made a million cases yourself, it would cost you $2.5 per pop, it's going to be two times a million, it's going to be 2,234,000. So it's substantially less to make them yourselves. So at some point, there's a break point, And that's what the company is going to be interested in finding out. The best way to actually move ahead to figure out what's going on is to come up with an influence diagram. So an influence diagram is a visual showing how entities or activities influence each other. So uh, parts of the, the Parts of the model are represented by circular or oval uh, symbols and called nodes, and they represent the activities. And you can connect these activities by arrows, and uh, the arrows show the influence, how one activity influences another. So this is what it looks like in our particular case. This is what the uh, influence uh, diagram looks like in our case. 
you've got the total cost. The total cost to make them yourself, this is when you manufacture it yourself, the total cost uh, is going to be split up into fixed costs and variable costs. In our case, the fixed cost was 234000 I'm not sure what the variable cost is because the variable costs are based on the variable cost per unit, which is $2 per unit, but it's also based on the quantity you produce. Okay, so that's the influence diagram uh, for these Nolan plastics. Now, this helps simplify the process and reduces the likelihood of making an error. So what we can add to this now, we're going to build into this uh, a separate section. So this is when you manufacture it yourself. And we're going to put outsourcing in here as well. We're going to include that. So let's do another, another uh, look at another uh, influence diagram where we've included that. Now what we have over here is exactly what we had on the previous page. Okay. I mean, this, this has been moved down a little bit, but that's what we had on the previous page. So what we've actually added in now is the possibility of outsourcing it. So if you outsource it, the influence diagram is showing us that the total outsource cost is going to be this. And the to total outsource cost is just going to be based on the quantity that you order uh, multiplied by the purchase price. And the purchase price, in our case, is $3.00. And 50 cents. So this gives us an overall uh, view of what's going on. And it, as I said, it helps us eliminate making mistakes. So how are we going to go about this? So we need to consider the cost of manufacturing the required units of the Viper. And uh, we need some, some background information. We basically know what the cost of manufacturing it is ourselves, don't we? We know that the cost to manufacture, let's put it here, manufacturing cost. Where's the manufacturing cost? Well, the manufacturing cost is going to be made up of a fixed cost. And it's going to also be made up of a uh, overall variable cost. But the variable cost is going to be the variable cost per unit, and we call let's call that VC. So down here, they're telling us that the variable cost per unit is VC, and uh, multiplied by the number of units, and the number of units or the quantity is just Q. So this is what it looks like. And in fact, uh, for fixed cost, I can just put FC, since we're told that it's FC down here. So let me just uh, eliminate that, just put in, We put in FC here. So this is the cost to manufacture. And so we're going to need that. And they're telling us down here that the total manufacturing cost is called TMC. So the total manufacturing cost of Q units is equal to this thing over here. So let's see what it tells us on the next page. There you go, exactly. That's what it's giving us. This is the this is the total manufacturing cost. Um, to make of Q units. So there's going to be your fixed cost of 234,000. There's going to be the variable cost per unit uh, times the number of units. So the variable cost per unit is $2. So it's going to be two times the quantity. So this is the total manufacturing cost to us. How about if we outsource? If we outsource uh, and we purchase from outside, this is going to be the total cost. It's going to be made up of P, the cost per unit, which in our case is $2 times the quantity we're going to buy. So if we buy a thousand, a thousand units at $3.50, we're going to spend three and a half thousand dollars. So this is what they've actually done here. Uh, so this is the, the, the total purchase cost of Q units is going to just be this formula up here. And in our specific case, we can actually put the P is 350. So now, now we know what the cost to manufacture ourselves and the cost of outsourcing is, it would be a good idea to find the savings from outsourcing. Obviously, if I'm going to make one unit, um, uh, if I manufacture one unit myself, it's going to be 234000 fixed cost plus $2 for that first unit. So it's going to be 234000 and $2 to make one unit. But if I purchase the unit, that unit from outside, it's only going to cost me $3.50. That's a very big difference. So when I'm only making one unit, when I only require one unit, I'm obviously going to outsource that unit. So what are the savings I make from outsourcing? So the savings made from outsourcing, they're calling SQ. And the savings you make from outsourcing 
is the difference between these two things here. It's the difference between the manufacturing cost and the uh, cost of outsourcing over here. So when you make one unit, the total manufacturing cost is going to be $234,002, and the cost of outsourcing is $3.50. So this is the savings you make by outsourcing it. And the, the question is, for what values is the uh, savings greater than zero? When the savings are greater than zero from outsourcing, you're going to outsource it. Um, you're not going to outsource it when you are going to actually lose money. When this value it becomes negative up here, when this becomes negative, it actually means that it's actually cheaper to manufacture it yourself. When we're building a spreadsheet model, uh, we want to keep our formulas and our uh, raw data, our inputs, like the numbers separate. When we keep that separate, it's very easy for me to actually go in and just change some of the inputs to see what the impact's going to be on the outputs. Um, so we can do like a what if analysis to see what's going on. I don't want to jumble my inputs, like my raw numbers, uh, with my formulas. I need to keep them separate. It, it, it leads to a better spreadsheet. So in our particular case, uh, these elements in here are formulas. The total manufacturing cost is a formula. The total purchase cost from outsourcing is a formula. Uh, the savings from outsourcing is a formula. Whereas, on the other hand, uh, Q and the quantity that you're going to buy, that's a decision that you're going to make, um, the fixed cost, the variable cost of one unit and the price of one unit, they are actually just regular numbers that are going to be input into the uh, spreadsheet. They're not formulas, they're regular numbers. And you'd like to keep those things separate. The number of uh, cases that they're going to make is actually a decision that's going to be made by the company. So the number they're going to make is going to be Q. And that's a decision uh, called a decision variable because that's a decision that's going to be made by the company. And you can see that the other items uh, down here, all these items, are actually known as uh, parameters. And parameters are just going to be the numbers that we put in. The fixed cost is something we're going to enter as a number. It's not a formula. So the things that are non-formulas are known as parameters. So this is the actual spreadsheet, and um, I'm gonna go across to the spreadsheet so we can see what it's doing, so we can play around with it uh, a little bit. And uh, let's just go over to it then. It's right there. So it's available to you. You can see it's called the Nolin, the Nolin Company Spreadsheet. So we open up this spreadsheet, and basically all the formulas that we've put in are in here, but also the parameters, the inputs. Remember the parameters are just the raw numbers you put in. The manufacturing cost is 234,000. You can see that's just a number input. The manufacturing cost, if we make it ourselves, is $2. The outsourcing cost, if we send it to somebody else, is $3.50. Is $3 and you can see, even though they're all inputs, there's a separation of them. It makes it clearer to understand. The actual quantity that we order is a decision that we make. And we've, again, it's an input. As you can see, they're all inputs. These are not formulas. Um, so. You know, you can see that they're not only the inputs, but they're separated out. This is uh, some sort of logical order. This is the manufacturing uh, inputs. This is the outsourcing inputs. And this is the quantity you decide to go with. And then down here, uh, these guys down here are all formulas. So the total cost to produce is the formulas that we showed earlier. The total cost to produce is 234000 plus uh, the, num the quantity you require times $2.00. That's the total cost to produce yourself. And how about the total cost to outsource? Well, total cost to outsource is the, the basically $3.50 times the quantity that you require. That's all that is. And the savings due to outsourcing is just going to be the difference between the total cost it would cost you to produce, take away the cost uh, for outsourcing. So the difference between those two is the savings due to outsourcing. So this is a, a really good spreadsheet um, for us. So at this point, we can actually use trial and error to try and figure different things out. We could say, well, if I make 
Well, it says right here, if I make 10,000 uh, of these, then if I if the, the savings I make by outsourcing it is 219,000, see if I make 10,000, uh, it will cost me 254,000 to produce them myself. It will only cost me 35,000 to actually outsource them. So the savings is gonna be 219,000. So that's good. So how about if I make 20,000? I can do trial and error. So at 20,000, um, I'm still gonna be saving money by outsourcing them. Uh, the gap is narrowing. Of this, I will be saving 204,000. How about if I make 50,000? Will I still make money from outsourcing? Will this figure change? Let's have a look. It does change, but I'm still saving money. But you can see um, that as I, the quantity increases, the savings decrease. There are 159,000 there. They make this 100,000. If I make 100,000 cases, how much do I actually save? 84,000. How about if I make 1 million cases? Oh, if I make 1 million cases, well, it's going to be uh, 200, uh, oh, sorry, 2 million, 234,000 to make them myself. And it will be uh, 3.5 million to outsource them. So this is the savings I made. I think I did this calculation a little bit earlier. Um, I was just putting just random figures in, hopefully, I got these values, but this is the benefit of using a, a spreadsheet because you can actually make sure that all your calculations are actually correct. So at what point is it that uh, we, we flipped over? We went from um, when we made you know, even 50 or 100,000, it was best to uh, outsource them. But at, when we're gonna make a million, if we need a million cases, then it's best to make them in-house because you're gonna save a lot of money. So at what point should we actually uh, switch from outsourcing to making them in-house? That's a great question to actually ask. Um, but before I move on to that, uh, notice that we've put all the inputs, all the parameters separately. I just want to point this out again. So you saw how easy it was me to change the input. And I can change any of these inputs quite easily, and they just feed through down to here. So uh, the, the reason that we set up spreadsheets and split things out is they're easy to update, they're easy for someone else to understand. Make sure that you format things correctly, column headings, don't use too much bold, don't use too many lines unless you're working out totals and stuff like that. And try and use simple formulas. If you've got the formulas, they're all very simple that we're using. We're not trying to use any really complicated formulas in here at all, okay? So let's move on. So we're gonna move on to looking at uh, trying to figure out the best way now to uh, work out, you know, if what's that break-even point? What do I need to do to find out that break-even point? How many should I produce um, where it doesn't make any difference between outsourcing and making them in-house? There must be a value in there. So how do we find that value? So this is the way we're going to set about uh, working out that value. We're actually going to use a what if analysis, um, and we're going to use something called a data table, a what if analysis, and the what if analysis. And what this does, it quantifies the impact on the output of changing a value of a specific input, which is what we were doing here. I was changing the value of a specific input. Let me change that again to say 50,000. And then you can see the, the impact on the savings. When I actually uh, press enter, you're gonna see, I see the impact. So uh, this is a what if analysis, but Excel does what if analysis for us as well. So I can use the data table to do that. And uh, a data table um, is basically uh, a tool which allows me to do exactly what I just showed you. And there's two types of data tables in Excel. There's a one-way data table and a two-way data table. A one-way data table summarizes a single input's impact on the output. So to actually do what I just did here by changing a single input and I want to see the impact on the output, I would use a one-way data table. And a two-way data table is um, if I want to change two of the inputs. So if I wanted to change the outsourcing cost and the quantity and I want to see the impact on savings. So I can use uh, what-if analysis to see that impact of changing those values. So let's do that. 
and uh, let's see how this actually works. So what I'm going to do is going to sell uh, D4. So if you want to do this as well, you can go into sell D4. And what I want to do is this test that, what I've been doing by changing the quantity. Okay, so I was changing these quantities in here over and over. So what I want to Excel to do is I'm going to say, look, the quantity is zero. Okay, I'm not going to make any. I mean, maybe it's just a starting point. The quantity is zero, and I want to know what is what are the savings going to be. So if it's zero, if I make zero, what's the savings going to be by outsourcing? I mean, it may seem a bit weird, but I'm going to save 234,000. How about if the uh, quantity I make is going to be 25,000? So I'll put 25,000 in here, 25,000. How much am I going to save? 196,000. So I can put when it's 25,000, when the quantity is 25,000, and I can build up a, a table. And uh, over here, I'm going to tell the, the table, I'm going to tell Excel to return 196,000. When I make 25,000, or when I require 25,000, my savings by outsourcing is 196. So I just want Excel to give 196. And I'm going to go in increments of, say, 25,000. Because I, I want the trial and error to be done by Excel, and not by me. I don't want to keep on typing these figures in. So I'm going to do it in increments of 25,000. So what I mean by that is that if the quantity is going to be, say, for example, 50,000, so I'm going to increase the previous one by 25,000, then what, what are my savings by outsourcing going to be? And so on. That's what I want to do. But you imagine this is going to take quite a bit of time, especially if I want to go all the way up to 300,000. If I'm making 300,000, what's the savings going to be? I don't want to be doing that one by one by one. So there's, there's a great feature in Excel um, that we can use to do this what if analysis. And this is the way it's going to work. Um, up here in this cell, I have to tell it what I'm trying to calculate. And what I'm trying to calculate is the savings. So I'm just going to put equals here, uh, the savings. I'm telling it the formula of what I want to, what I want it to calculate for me, which is going to be the savings. It seems a bit weird that I put that in there. And it's defaulted to 196,000 just because I've had 25,000 in here. When you're doing this, if you've got a different value in this, uh, in, in other than 25,000, this is going to be a different value. But it doesn't make any difference. It's still going to work. So how do I set about it? So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to select these cells, D4, all the way to E17. And then I'm going to click up here on the data tab. I happen to already be in it, but click on the data tab. And then I'm going to go across uh, to the uh, what if analysis. So you see the what if analysis over here. And then I'm going to go to data table. And I'm going to get this, which is great. So it says row input cell and column input cell. Now I've only got columns here. I don't have any ro any, any any rows. So I've just got this column. So uh, since there's no rows, I'm just going to come down to here. So what this is basically saying is uh, what do you want me to do? And what, what I'm going to tell Excel is I'm going to tell it I want you to uh, come to here, in this, to this column, see column, I want you to come to this column, take the value in there, the, the first value in here of quantity zero, put it into here, and then I want you to return this, this uh, formula value. And that's why we put the formula up here. And then I want you to work all the way down the column. Then I want, I'm telling Excel, I want you to put 25,000 into cell B11. So let's put B11 there, okay? So I want you to put 25,000 into cell B11, work out the savings due and put them here. And Excel knows what to calculate because I told it the formula up here. So when I press OK, it's gonna populate all of this in here. So let's press OK and there you go. So that's actually calculated for us, um, done all that what-if analysis. So if, for example, um, I make 150,000 cases, or I want 150,000 cases, uh, the savings from outsourcing is $9,000. We could just check that. Let me put 150 in here, 150, 150,000. And you can see that the savings are 9,000. See that? When I make 150,000, 
I save 9,000, which is exactly what we have in here. When I make 175,000, how about that? 175,000. And that says that, oh, I'm going to make a loss of 28,500. And that's exactly what that is saying. So 175 minus 28. So this has done the whole what if analysis for us, and it's, it's pretty useful. So um, that's a useful tool to save us a lot of time on the what if analysis. But we can go further than that. Let's just suppose that this company, um, this company has uh, the option of other people to outsource to that are going to charge them different amounts of money. So um, supposing there's one company that is prepared to do this stuff for them, make, make these cases for them for, let's put some different values. Um, instead of $3.50, there's another dollar that will do it for $2.89. There's another company that will do it for $3.13. We still get access to this first company that will do, it, do them for $3.50. Another company is $3.54. And let's put in one more of $3.59. So you've got different companies you can choose from. Now, if you're making a purely financial decision, you will choose this company in here because they're the cheapest. It's very simple. But sometimes you have to take other things into account, such as um, are all these companies, uh, do all these companies have the same reliability? Do they have the same quality? Do they... Do they have the propensity to actually deliver on time? Because you may choose to go with the more expensive company uh, because the more expensive company has got a high quality product and they'll deliver on time. They're very reliable rather than save some money but actually go for another company that are unreliable. They don't produce very good products. So uh, this pricing is just one of the aspects that you're going to take into consideration when you're making your decision. You're not just going to look at one aspect and that's it, price. Well, some people may do, but it should be one of many that you look at. So um, if I want to do a what-if analysis, like, so after, this is a what-if analysis when it's $3.50. Okay, so what am I going to do if it's not $3.50? What am I going to do um, if it's $2.89? So I want to produce another column for $2.89. I want to produce produce another column if it's $3.13, uh, $3 etc. Again, that's going to be a lot of work. So I really do not want to actually do that in one fell swoop. I want to do it in one fell swoop. I don't want to do it individually. So how am I going to do that? Well, um, what this is, this is going to be a two-way table, isn't it? Because not only do I want to change the quantities, all these different quantities, but now I want to change the different prices as well. So I'm going to go to two-way table. Now, one thing I have to do is um, I'm going to delete all of this. See, this figure in here needs to now be in here. It's a bit weird, but um, it has to be over here of this formula. So in here now, I'm actually going to put the formula. So I want, I want Excel to calculate the savings due. So I'm going to put the formula in now. And that's why I want it to calculate. And then I'm just going to delete all of this stuff. So let's uh, delete that. So what do I do? Along here, I'm going to put the different uh, uh, different outsourcing costs. So I've got one company that will do it for $2.89. I've got another company that will do it for $3.13. Another company that will do it for $3.50. Another co company for $3.54. Another company for $3.59. There you go. So it's going to be a lot of work to go through and, and work all of these out for my what if analysis to help me make a decision. So how do I actually go about um, getting Excel to do all this work for me? So again, um, we're going to go to uh, the same area we were in before. We're going to go to uh, data and we're going to have to go to the what if analysis. But before I actually hit the what if, I need to highlight these cells. I need to highlight these cells. And then I'm going to go to the what if analysis. And then I'm going to go down to the data table. But this time, um, I want to do, use both the rows and the columns. Well, I already know what the, uh, the, these things are, don't I? I already know what the columns are. Uh, in the columns, uh, I'm actually going to put the 
let's go to the top of the columns, I'm actually just going to tell Excel to put in the, the figure of the quantity because in the columns I've got the quantities. In the column, I've got the quantities. And in the rows, what do I have in the rows? The rows I have the different outsourcing costs. So I'm going to put the outsourcing costs in the rows. So what is this saying? You're telling Excel in the rows, I want you to go through this table one by one by one, and I want you in the rows to uh, take whatever you've got in the row. So in the row, it knows that this is a formula, so it's going to omit this. It's going to start here. So Excel is going to start and say, look, I've got 289 in the row, and I'm going to put it into cell B7. So I'm actually going to put 289 into B7. I'm also going to go to the column and put zero uh, into cell B11 into here. And then I'm going to calculate the savings and put it in here. And basically, I'm going to work throughout this, uh, this table and fill those values in. And there you go. So um, I've got the what-if analysis for all the different prices. And I can figure out when they're going to break even. Like these guys, if I spend $2.89 on outsourcing, then I know that um, I'm going to start to... Uh, well, there's somewhere between 250,000, 275,000 units. I'm going to go from a point where outsourcing is the best thing to do to the point where I would lose money if I outsource. So at this point, I have to bring them back home and make them myself or make them in-house. Okay. So uh, the question we haven't answered yet is uh, at what point, at what point do, is, does the break-even occur? We don't know where the break-even occurs. We know for this one, it's between these two points. How about for the original one we were looking at? Let's just change the color. The three, the, oops, a bit too dark. How about, how about for this column here? The original uh, manufacturer, uh, 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 the guy that we would outsource to, uh, we'll give them $3.50. We know that the break even point is going to be somewhere between, break even is going to be somewhere between. Uh, these amounts. This is, I make a profit by outsourcing, now I make a loss by outsourcing. So between these two amounts is where there's going to be a break-even point. So somewhere between 150 and 175,000 units, I'm going to switch from uh, outsourcing to actually make, making them in-house. But where? What's the actual value? So uh, to do that, there is uh, another uh, a great feature that Excel has. It's the benefit of using these spreadsheets. And that thing is called Gold, Gold Seek. Gold Seek. And Gold Seek is basically just going to uh, uh, seek the goal, as, as it actually suggests. So uh, Gold Seek is, I'm going to say, look, um, I want the savings to be equal to zero. That's my goal. And I want you to figure out how I achieve my goal of the savings being zero. Uh, by changing the quantity, okay? So that's how I want the outcome to be zero. And I want you to tell me, what is the quantity I need to put in here to make the outcome zero? I know it's going to be somewhere between 150 and 175,000, but I don't want to keep on going through myself and saying, okay, well, at 150, um, 150,000 units, I make 9,000 profit uh, uh, is, in additional money uh, by outsourcing and making it myself. Uh, and how about 151,000? You could actually do that. So, okay, what was it? 151,000. What happens at 151? Well, see, the profit has gone from 9,000 down to 7,500. How about 152,000? What do we get there? Oh, the profit's reduced down to 6,000. Oh, so getting, getting close now. How about 153,000? Hmm. Profit's only 4,500 by outsourcing. How about 154,000? Profit's only 3,000. Getting closer to zero, to zero uh, savings by outsourcing. Zero savings from outsourcing means that um, it, it doesn't make a difference if you outsource. And if you push the quantity above that, then you will save money from outsourcing. So uh, 154, let's try, one, let's try 155,000, 1,500, let's try 156,000, 
oh, there you go. So to save me actually having to go through all of those and try and figure out exactly at which point there's going to be no difference between outsourcing and making them in-house. To save that process, then I can use goal C. Goal C will do exactly what I did. I'm telling you I want the answer to be zero and it will find the number you need to put in here to make this number here come out to zero. Now, in our case, it, was, it wasn't too bad because it was a nice, nice round number. It could have been a really difficult number to come up with and it could have taken us a long time to actually do that. So how do we actually do goal C? Now, in this particular example, my outsourcing cost is $3.50. So what do I need to do? So um, again, I'm going to make sure I'm clicked on data and then I'm going to go to uh, what if analysis. And this time I'm going to go to goal seek. So in goal seek, um, let's look at what we've got now. So I want to set sell. I want to set the savings equal to zero. Okay, by changing the quantity. So that's exactly what I was just doing. I was I was I was changing the quantity until. I got the savings to come out to zero. And Excel is going to do that for us uh, very quickly. And in here, it's going to, it's going to give me the exact figure. Um, you're not going to see any change right now because I had the right figure in there. So let's suppose I had a different figure in there. Let's put like um, 200,000. So put a different figure in there. So um, in this case, uh, when the uh, outsourcing cost is $3.50, when you're making 2000 200,000 units, then you'll make a loss by outsourcing. But anyway, let's run the goal seek again. So hit the what if analysis, goal seek. And so I want to set, so B17, the uh, savings due to outsourcing equal to zero by changing the quantity. So now you're going to see a number change because before I actually had the right number in it, so it didn't change anything. So you're going to see now that it's changed it to 156,000 and we're going to accept that answer. If you want to test it for the other ones in here, make sure that you test, you change this in your test. Um, so if I wanted to figure out what's the break even point um, when, when it's a uh, $2.89, $2 I'd have to put in the $2.89 into here. And then I'd run the test. And so I'm going to say, what if goal seek, um, so I want my savings to be zero by changing this quantity in here and it's telling me it should be uh, 262,000 and would that is that in the right range let's have a quick look well yeah because I know from down here when I'm when it's when the outsourcing cost is two dollars and 89 cents break even point is somewhere uh, here which is between 250 and 275,000. It's in fact 262,000. So uh, I'll show you what we just did on the spreadsheet here. So this is just what we're talking about, the general principles of how you actually set the spreadsheet up. And then we did the what if analysis on the spreadsheet. We looked at uh, the what if analysis of the data tables um, and the one-way table and the two-way tables. The one-way table is where you change one input and you want to figure out what the output's going to be. The two ways when you change two inputs, so you want to figure out what the output's going to be. And this shows you how we did it. This was the example of the one-way table. This was the example um, of the outcome of uh, using the one-way table to get all these results. And uh, this is the uh, example going through the two-way table, changing two things, not changing only the quantity, but also changing the outsourcing cost per unit. Um, and there were the outcomes that we got right in there. And then we use goal seek. Um, so the goal seek is when you say, this is what I want to get. I want to have zero um, uh, savings from outsourcing. So there's no difference between outsourcing and making in-house. And what do I need to change um, the quantity to, to achieve that? So we use goal seek there. And that's how we use the goal seek. And there were the outcomes that we actually got for it. And so let's look at something else now. Uh, there's three uh, sets of uh, useful Excel functions. So sum product and, and what is sum and sum product? 
Uh, well, let me just show you through uh, an example here. So this is data is available to you. It's the Foster example, Foster generators. Foster generators um, have, I guess, three different manufacturing plants where they make their generators, one in Cleveland, one in Bedford, one in York. And they actually ship them out to Boston, Chicago, St. Louis, and Lexington. And to ship a generator out from Cleveland to Boston costs $3 a head. Um, to ship one out from um, say York to St. Louis is $4 per head. And what's the actual amount they ship out? Well, from Cleveland to Boston, they ship out 5,000. So um, if they're shipping out 5,000 and it's costing $3, that's gonna be 15,000 to the total cost to ship those out. And from York, they ship out to St. Louis, they ship out 1,000 at $4 a head. So that's gonna cost them 4,000 to ship those out. So we could actually calculate that very laboriously. I'm not suggesting you do it this way, but I can say, okay, the cost of going from Cleveland to Boston, um, so let's just put it in here, it's gonna be 5,000 times $3 a head. And that's the total cost to ship those 5,000 out, $15,000. How about the shipment from Bedford to Boston? Well, there's a thousand of those at $6 a head. So to calculate that, it's going to equal a uh, thousand times $6 a head. Uh, fortunately for the calculation, uh, York to Boston, they may be $2 a head, but we're not actually shipping any out. So that's just going to be a zero. Now, if I want to fill these in, what I can do is I can actually do it fairly quickly. Okay, these are going to be the actual charges. So I just did that to save a bit of time. But for example, let's click on this. So if I want to go from uh, ship from Bedford to Chicago, I've got 4,000 units at $5 a head, and that's gonna be $20,000. So I just went through those, the ones that are zero, where I'm not shipping any, there may be a charge to ship them, but I'm not shipping any, that's why we're getting the zeros in here. So that's the individual shipping uh, cost. And if I want to figure out all those costs, I can use sum, and sum's just gonna be equals sum, rather than trying to add those guys up one by one by one. I can just do sum of all those, and that's going to give me $54,500. Uh, so that's good. Um, so sum's very useful uh, because I didn't have to actually add up. You know, it's gonna be this plus this plus, and go all the way through this plus, uh, very laborious, this plus, and go all the way through that whole array um, that's what I'd have to do if I was going to just add them up individually. So sum is pretty powerful to actually do that for us. It just adds them all up in one go. And that's very good. Now, there's something else I could have done a lot quicker. I could have used another function called sum product. Now, when you see um, uh, stuff in stats and mathematics, sum product, the thing that you say second or that comes second normally goes first. So sum product, you, need, you normally take the product first and then you sum. Um, it's a strange quirk of mathematics, but when they put stuff together, the thing that comes second is actually the thing that you do first. So sum product means I want to take the product, I want to do the, the same calculation, but basically what I did was I multiplied this by this, and then this by this, and then this by this, and all the way through, that's what these are. And then I wanted to sum them. So I wanted to take the product first, that times that, that's the product, that's the product, that's the product, these are all products, and then I wanted to sum them. So uh, some product. There's an actual uh, formula in Excel that will do all of that in one go, and it's called sum product. So uh, equals sum, uh, sum product. So sum product, it says, um, I want you to take uh, the product and then take the sum of the, the two sets of numbers. So I'm going to put this set of numbers in first, then I'm going to separate them with a comma, and then I'm going to put this set of numbers in here and just close the parentheses. And what that will do, it will go through in sequence and do exactly what I did. It will take the product of three and 5,000, get 15,000, and then uh, two times zero and get zero, seven times zero and so on, and then six times 1,000 and get 6,000. It will take the product first of the, those two sets of numbers. It will do them in a sequence. It's not gonna just uh, scramble them. It's gonna do them in sequence. And after it's come up with the product of each of those is then going to sum them and come up with the 54,500 in one fell swoop. So that's obviously a lot faster than what we did. Sum product is very, very useful. So uh, let's move on, on to the uh, uh, next one. So uh, 
a couple of more Excel functions that we're going to look at and uh, one of them is the if and the next one is the count if. So if, if says you put in a condition, it says if this condition is correct, comma, whatever you see after the comma is going to be the result. So if the condition that you set in here is true, then you're going to come up with this result. Otherwise, after the second comma, if the condition is not true, then you put in this result. So that's the if statement. The count if statement says count how many occurrences uh, there are in this range that meet this condition. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually move over to uh, an example and uh, this example is made available to you and um, I'll just give you a brief uh, rundown on it. Uh, company Gambrel Manufacturing is making uh, some sort of radios. They've got one, two, three, four different components that go into making the radio. At the end of the day, they count their inventory. So for this particular component, they've only got five left out at the end of the day. And before they start work the next day, they have to get up to 100. So they have to order up to get up to the point where they've got 100 at the start of each day. So in this case, if they've got five at the end of the day, they're going to have to order in an extra 95 to get up to 100. And um, this is what is down here. But how about the next uh, component? Uh, at the end of the day, they've got 30. They need to have 55 by the morning. So they have to order in an extra 25. This component, they only need to have 70. They've got 70 on hand and they're not going to order anymore. And this is the price for each unit. So the first component, the, units for, the unit price is $4.50. And you can see the unit prices for the other components. And then the fixed cost of, per order is $120. So every time they put in an order for some of the 570 components, they have to order $120. When they order the 578 components, they'll have to pay an additional $120. So each individual order costs them $120. Now, they are given a break. If the minimum order size um, is 50 uh, or more, it's over 50, in fact, if they order over 50, then they're going to only pay 90% of whatever price is in here. So um, these are all inputs, as you can see. And down here, there's formulas that calculate all this stuff. But what I'm going to do for you over here is I'm going to put the formulas in so you can see them being constructed. It's the same data. So um, let me just delete that. Um, so if I want to actually calculate the uh, order quantity, the amount I have to order for each day is just going to simply be it's going to be um, the value in here, 100, minus what I've got on hand. And what I have on hand, I've got 5. So the order quantity is fairly easy to work out. It's just the difference between those two values. And I, I can actually copy that across like that. Okay, so you can just double click on these to see what it is. So the, the order quantity for component uh, 578, uh, the next day, is actually be 55 minus 30, which is 25. Uh, for components 471, I need to have 70. I already got 70. I'm not going to order zero. And likewise for the last one. So how about the cost of goods? So the way I'm going to work out the cost of goods is to figure out how much is the cost of uh, each item that I am going to be ordering. So you may say, well, the cost of 570 is 450. Well, yeah, it is. But there's this issue of the uh, discount. And in this case, this one will get a discount because they're ordering over 50. This one will not get a discount. This one is not going to order anything. And this one will not get a discount either. That's going to be a lot of work to actually do. But we can actually put in a formula ourselves that's going to do that for us. So I'm going to use the if statement. So equals if. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the cost of each unit first. Um, so for this one, it's going to be 450 times 90% because you're ordering 95 but this one is just going to be 1250, no discounts. You're only ordering 25. You have to order over 50 to get the discount. So how am I going to put that into a formula? Uh, so what I'm just basically going to say is if the order quantity, uh, if that order quantity is greater than the uh, 50, and is that one in there? Now, I'm going to actually put dollar signs on, the F, uh, on, on this uh, J10. And the reason is I'm going to copy this formula across and I'll, this 50 refers to uh, is, uh, all these components. So um, I put the dollar signs on that. So I'm going to say if this statement is true, so if basically the order quantity is greater than 50, 
then, comma, then, that's what the comma means, then I want you to give a discount. And the way I give a discount is I'm going to uh, uh, give them a price of 90%. And again, I want this to be common to all of these, so I'm going to put dollar signs on it. And I'm going to multiply it by 90% of the price. Okay? And then I'm going to put comma. Otherwise, if, if the order quantity is not greater than 50, I just want you to charge them the regular price. So that's the price to charge for each unit. And then all I have to do is multiply by the number of units I'm going to order. And the number of units I'm going to order in this case is the order quantity. And that should give us this $384.75, which is what we have over here. And now, because I've put in this formula into Excel, benefit of spreadsheets, I can just copy across. And that's why I also put dollar signs in for these items up here, because these things are common to all of these. And I get this in here. These are the same cost of goods. What's the total order uh, number of orders I'm going to make? Because for each order I make, I'm going to have to pay $120. Well, I'm going to make one, two, no, three. I'm going to make three orders. But again, I don't want to be calculating that. And I may have like hundreds of items. Uh, we've only done it with four different components here. I'm going to have a thousand components. So it's much easier if I actually uh, come up with a, a formula to uh, figure that out. So what I'm going to do on that, I'm going to use the count if. So it's count if. So it's count if in this range. Okay, so that's my condition, remember? Uh, so that's my range for which I'm going to uh, now give a condition. So in that range, okay, and I'm not going to copy this formula across so I don't have to put dollar signs in it. In that range, comma, um, the, the criteria is going to be that if it's greater than zero, if the order is greater than zero, I want to count it. So I, the way you do that with numbers in Excel is you put a quotation sign and you're going to put the greater than sign and then zero and then quotation sign again and then close the parentheses. So count if in that blue range in here, uh, we've got values greater than zero. We've got one, two, three of them that are greater than zero. So that should give us our three. So that's going to count up everything that we need. So the total fixed costs now are going to be equal to $120 times three because we made three orders and you pay them for each time you make an order. And how about the total cost of goods? Well, the total cost of goods is just going to be equal to the sum of these. And that comes to 813. And your total cost overall, your fixed cost uh, plus your cost of goods is just going to be equal to the sum of these two. And there you go, there you have it. The outcome we actually came up with looks something like that. Let's just move on. VLOOKUP. What is VLOOKUP? Um, well, I'm going to explain through an example. Uh, let's see what it says here. It says, uh, this function allows the user to pull a subset of data from a larger table of database or some criterion. The general form of VLOOKUP is you put in the value that you want to look up, and then you put a table that you want to look up that value in, so that value will belong in this table. Um, and then in that table, uh, you want to find another value which, which in some way corresponds to the first value, um, and then you want to put in uh, the range uh, which is going to be true or false. That sounds a bit complicated, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the example that they give you in the PowerPoints, but I'm not actually going to use that to be honest with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make up my own example, which is going to be uh, seen a little bit more relevant um, and easier to understand. So let's suppose I've got a bunch of students that take an exam. And so one student gets 60 on the exam, one gets 90 on the exam, one gets 80 on the exam, the other gets uh, 69 on the exam, the other gets 70 on the exam, another 79, another 80, another 89, and another the last student gets 90 on the exam. And what I want to do is actually give grades uh, to the students like A, B, C, D, or F. So we know that um, the, the, what, when do we get a grade A? Let's see, it's going to here. Um, so 
a grade A is over here. So you're going to get a grade A if you get, uh, say, 90 plus. And then you're going to get a B if you get between, uh, let's see, between 80 and 89.9999. Uh, and you're going to get a C uh, if you get between 70 and uh, 79.999 and you're going to get a D if you get between 60 and um, if you get between 60 and 69.999 and you're going to get um, an F if you get below basically if you get uh, if you get 59.999 or less Okay, so you can imagine uh, when it comes to the end of the semester and I have to put in a grade for all the students, uh, what I have to do is I like, come along to this point here and put grade in, and I have to go through and put students' grades in. And it's kind of easy to make a mistake, and I don't want to make any mistakes with students' grades. They've worked so hard through the whole semester. So the table I put down here, the, the information I put down here, I'm going to put into a table uh, right here. You can put it wherever you want, but um, I'm going to put it right there. So um, what I'm going to say is uh, if you get a zero on the exam, you're going to get grade F. In fact, if you get all the way up to, but not including 60, you're going to get a grade F. So anywhere between zero and 60 is going to be an F. But once you hit 60 on an exam, then you're going to get a grade D. And you're going to get a, a grade D all the way up to 69.999, uh, up to 70, but not including 70. So a D is going to be valid from 60 up to, but not including 70. Once you hit 70, then you're going to get a C. And that C is going to uh, be the score you're going to get all the way up to, but not including 80. So you'll get a C anywhere from 70 up to 79.99999. And once you actually hit 80, you're going to get a B. And then um, you're going to get that B all the way up to, but not including 90. So up to 89.99999, not including 90. Once you hit the 90, uh, you're actually going to get a grade A. So um, I've summarized that into a table. And you can see the table, as I write down the numbers, I went in increasing order. They have to be in order and they have to be in increasing order from what I'm going to show you now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that uh, VLOOKUP. And that VLOOKUP function, so we can understand what it means, is going to be equals VLOOKUP. Uh, and let's uh, come over a little bit. So at VLOOKUP, so what do I want to look up? The first thing I want to look up is the 60 for this student. So I want to look up the 60. And then I'm going to say, OK, I'm looking up. That student got 60. So what, what grade should I actually give them? And then I say, okay, well, let's look at the table where I've actually put. You can see I want to look at the table where I've actually want to be my base. And this is my table in here. So I'm saying, I want you to take that 60 and look it up in this table. Now, I'm going to copy this formula down, and I don't want to copy the, the, the table uh, location down. So I'm going to put dollar signs on for the table. And then I'm going to put comma. So I, I said, I, I want to look up the student's score in this table, okay, and um, I want you to return a value from the table. In this case, I want you to return the grade. So I want you to look up the number in the first column, and I want you to return the letter grade from column two. So because it's column two of the table, I'm going to put a two in here. That just says, okay, find the grade, and then once you find the grade, in this case 60, then I want you to go to not the first column, the second column, and tell me what you see in the second column, which in this case uh, should be a D. And then uh, the last thing is going to ask me for range. And range corresponds to, do I want an approximate match true, or do I want an exact match? Well, I'm going to put in the correct answer for this particular scenario, which is an approximate match. And I'll tell you why that is as we move on. And so I'm going to put in true, and then I'm going to close that off, and I'm going to get that student should get a D. So how is it is that for me when I've got 120 students in my regular semester classes? I do that, and I can copy this formula down, and I can get their grades all very quickly, and they're correct rather than me trying to do it in my head. 
So um, before I tell you the difference between uh, uh, true and false, or show it to you, this is pretty cool because you know the student got 60 and a 60 is a D, a 90 is an A, an 80 is a B, a 69 just missed it, but unfortunately they're gonna get a D and not a C, they just missed the C, 70 is a C, 79 is still a C, and so on, these are all correct. And that, that does it for me very quickly and very efficiently. Now, when we did the formula, we put true. We were, were, were prepared to take an approximate match. And what an approximate match means that um, this student that got 69, well, this student that got 60, first of all, 60 appears in the table, so that's great. 90 appears in the table as well. 80 appears in the table as well. 69 does not appear in the table. So if I put down that I want an exact match, if I put um, false, um, that you know I want an exact match, false means I want an exact match, if I put down false, then it's gonna look for 69 and it's not gonna be able to find anything. But when you put in true, that I'm prepared to take an approximate match, that's what true means, um, it says, okay, I don't have 69, but I know that 69 is, uh, between these two values, so it's going to return the D. It says it's you know it's uh, 69 is greater than 60. It hasn't quite matched 70, so I'm going to give it a grade D. Likewise with 79, there's no 79 in the table, but it figures out that 79 is between 70 and 80, and um, it's that's that's the benefit of using a uh, true because it's going to give you an approximate match. If I change this to false. And there's some certain scenarios where you would use it, but not in this one. False says that um, I want an exact match. So what's going to happen now when I copy this formula down? So 60 is an exact match. That's great. 90 is an exact match. 80 is an exact match. 69 is not an exact match. And it says not applicable because it says, look, I can't find an exact match for 69. If I copy these down, Oh, it can't find an exact match for 79 or 89. So that's the reason that in this particular case, we're not interested in an exact match. We just want an approximate match. So that's why in here, for this particular example, we're going to put true. And when it's true, it's actually gonna say, you know, I don't want an exact match. There will happen to be exact, but this is 69 is not an exact, and it's going to figure it out and say, oh, yeah, well, that's a D. And so uh, that's so that would work anyway, but this is going to figure it out, say, okay, we don't want an exact match. 79 doesn't exist in the table, but that should be a C, and likewise down to there. So that's um, the lookup, and um, it's, it's kind of very powerful to use. Remember to always put these in ascending order. So you, once you start writing, and you're moving down, you put them in increasing order. 